Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You are about to listen to the Soulful CXO Podcast with Dr. Rebecca Wynn. These conversations focus on the intersection of technology, business, and humanity, exploring how these three areas impact each other. Dr. Wynn interviews guests, including business leaders, entrepreneurs, and experts in various fields to share insights and experiences on cybersecurity, risk management, and leadership. The podcast aims to provide a fresh perspective on how technology can be leveraged to create positive change in the world. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Soulful CXO. I am your host, Dr. Rebecca Wynn. We are pleased to have with us today, Chuck Brooks. The globally recognized thought leader and subject matter expert in cybersecurity and emerging technologies. He is adjunct faculty at Georgetown University's Graduate Cybersecurity Risk Management Program, where he teaches courses on risk management, homeland security, technologies, and cybersecurity. Chuck is one of the top tech people to follow on LinkedIn. He is a GovCon expert for Executive Mosaic and GovCon Wire, cybersecurity expert for the network at Washington Post visiting editor, Homeland Security Today, and a contributor to Skytop Media and Forbes. Chuck, great to see you again. Welcome to the show. Great to see you again. A pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rebecca. We've been on several shows before. I think your background is fascinating, so you can walk us through that because you started in poli-sci, then you got yeah. a little bit more in strategy, and then you became the thinker on the hill. I love to yeah. hear that story. When I went to college, we didn't even have electric typewriters, let alone the internet. I was interested in the, the global Scenario was a liberal arts school in Indiana called DePauw, which I loved, by the way. It was only a couple thousand people. And you know, I was from Chicago originally and sort of go back into the, the Indiana heartland where all the farms are. It was fun. And you know, people were genuine and nice. So I enjoyed it. So poli sci and English were my focus there. And then I went immediately to University of Chicago and studied international relations and particularly more of the national security realm. And I came to Washington, D.C. And, and that's a typical Washington, D.C. story. I went to some party I befriended a retired general who is uh, also former deputy director of the CIA and former head of DIA, Lieutenant General Danny Graham. And he said, would you like to do some writing for me? And I said, sure. I wrote some stuff on strategic missiles, high frontier, SDI, all that stuff. And he said, you're doing a great job. Would you like to serve in the Reagan administration? I said, yeah, that would be fun. I got an appointment to assist to the director under Richard Carlson. You probably know his son, Tucker Carlson. <laughs> Richard uh, head of Voice of America. It was still the Cold War and uh, not a secret now, but a lot of the stuff and the communication activities and different language stuff, which was then by shortwave radio, it wasn't even, you know, the internet yet either. And they were weighing computers now that I'm working on. I worked there for a while and got picked up, worked on the Hill for almost 10 years doing technology and security issues. And you see the evolving capabilities of the technology back then. Then people were starting to look at, you know, the implications of new emerging technologies and the new revolution ahead, but not quite. And then uh, I got a call, would you like to be part of a big startup? A big startup happened to be DHS. So uh, that's really when I think I could say my cybersecurity career, because uh, I was hired to, as uh, in legislative affairs to help set up and create two directorates. One was a science and technology directorate, which is still around. And the other one is a domestic nuclear office eaten up by s and My role was to work with SMEs and create stuff, mostly chem, bio, rad, nuke, explosive focus initially, but there was a strong cybersecurity element and it was just the beginning where everything was getting connected. I worked on those issues, prepared briefs, and got really into the area. When I left, I followed that career path and then most recently I retired out of General Dynamics Mission Systems, where I was doing a lot of growth strategy for cybersecurity in that role. I learned a lot. So I didn't come from the technical background, but you know, I think I caught up. And now I'm doing my own thing, teaching and consulting. It's an interesting career path. You mentioned the Reagan administration, but what was the other administration you worked under? Uh, the Bush administration under DHS when it was set up. First for Secretary Tom Ridge and then Secretary Michael Chertoff. I stayed for two secretaries and I, oh. I kept my ties. I'm very active with DHS still. And it's fun to see the, you know, the, the change, the focus that has changed from the counterterrorism focus to the cyber focus there too, in terms of at least funding. <laughs> That's great. So it's interesting under different administrations. I 
when I did the DOD work with NCI information systems, I was doing all of the base realignment. I ended up having Bush and Obama. And a lot of times when you have administration changes, the world can change very quickly yes. uh, in a lot of those projects. And, but the one thing is, is that failure is not an option and you, you got to get her done. And so when people, exactly. people say, well, how come you, how did you cut your teeth so quickly in technology and all that kind of stuff? Cause I was boots on the ground and hectic situations. You got to figure it out. You can't always Google and get to know how to read. Exactly. You have to learn from others too. There's a lot of institutional knowledge and legacy that you build on as well as looking forward. Plus, I think really it's interesting, mostly in the technology and cyber world, that, that's the least partisan of all the issues I've ever had to deal with, you know, because people are, are focused really on, on the application of the technologies and the threats. It's not accolades or whatever. It's really it keep us all safe. So it's a really different perspective, I think, politically when you work in technology and cybersecurity. You're well known as being a thought leader, looking at emerging technologies, things along those lines. And you said this publicly, the cyber ecosystem is in precarious situation. How do you see the advancements in artificial intelligence and machine learning helping and hindering security operations? That's a really good question. You know, I think it's precarious for a lot of reasons. One is, is because we never thought of security first is either a company or as a government. And of course the internet wasn't invented to be secure. We're all going at this, you know, from the, from the back end trying to fix things. But uh, the, the reality is that, as you said, artificial intelligence is not new, but some of the capabilities are new as, as you grow in supercomputing power and other things. And, and so I, I see that being a really key transitional aspect of cybersecurity for several reasons. One is we just don't have enough cyber expertise and people out there to do stuff or at least they don't want to go into it. There's a global shortage. Second, there's too much complexity out there in all these tools and, and be able to orchestrate them and run them. And, and a lot of people in IT shops leave and then there's no one there. So so artificial intelligence is, is an enabler, it's a tool, and it's basically used for, for helping automate things. So in that sense, it's really good for automating, you know, threat detection, identity aspects, you know, proving who's what, looking what's in the system, and maybe collating some of the data too, structured and unstructured. But it, it also has, you know, it's like every most technology, it's a dual edge because the adversaries and hackers can use it. And the reality is the hackers already have advantage. I call them criminal hackers. And there's a lot of white hat hackers too. It's asymmetrical because they have many targets, governments, organizations, big companies are targeted, but they have more expertise and capabilities. The small and medium businesses, the bulk of a lot of what's out in the United States, most of them have no clue. They don't even have a C-suite expertise. They're easy to target and they're targeting them now in a rapid fashion using these machine learning capabilities to scout for vulnerabilities and exploit them to mass send out phishing attacks. They're also state sponsored with geopolitics changing. We know you have the two leading countries in that, Russia and China, devoting a whole lot of time to the digital aspects of cyber warfare and espionage and and then all the various organized groups under them that sort of do their beckoning for them. It's a dangerous landscape. They're using the technology and defenders have to do the same. We're at an early stage. We'll see in the next few years and throughout the decade that artificial intelligence is a requirement for any company to protect itself because there's too much data, too many technologies, too much threat for people to handle. You talk a lot about quantum computing and the dangers along those lines. And I know a few years ago, everyone thought, ah, oh, you know, even all the, the new quantum computers are coming out of China and things along those lines, it's still many years away. Now that AI has taken off in fruition, I think now there's like a thousand different companies out there who are developing products. What do you think about the AI apocalypse? Well, I mean, the, the risks are pretty high with both. You know, I, again, like there's, there's a lot of people out there, including Elon Musk that say that you know, artificial intelligence is going to be our undoing. It's going to advance to such a stage that it's going to basically take over everything. I don't think it's ever going to be sentient. What I worry about with artificial intelligence is humans using it as a tool. It could have apocalyptic capabilities with nefarious actors using it. You know, for instance, they could, you know, inject polymorphic warfare, well, malware all over the place and disguise it and, and being triggered by biometrics. There's so many technologies and capabilities to fuse with. I think artificial intelligence could be very disruptive. The debate now is do we regulate or we don't regulate it? And, and you know, you know, obviously there's ethical considerations and then there's bias considerations in it, but it's difficult to regulate anything, let alone 
in the United States, you talk about the globe. And the problem is, is geopolitically, is it we mentioned that, you know, the Russians, Chinese, uh, Iranians and North Koreans are not going to regulate anything that's going to be advantage to them. It's a one-sided thing when you call a moratorium to start researching. We need to invest heavily in learning and building and computing capabilities. With quantum, it's the same. It's a race. We're working with allies, but China is advanced. They've done quantum communication. The technologies are not necessarily having one big quantum computer. It's really using the, the, the physics of it to do analytics and predictive analytics. There's different types of computers, even photonic computers are available now that could do similar things. The fear is whoever gets Q-Day capability will dominate and encrypt everything, have secure communications and dominate every industry. So I see seriousness of both those, AI and quantum. And then if you combine them, if you think about that capability, that just is, is a frightening scenario. They're here. You can't stop researching and doing stuff. You just got to make sure that others realize they can't overtake you and you have to prepare to defend yourselves. Yeah. We have a lot of startups and startup can be, you know, a stealth mode. Part of it is your mindset on, on being in that kind of growth or hyper growth or really not putting the time and effort into security, privacy, and compliance. I've seen it personally and I've heard from other people where it's like, you know, we, we don't think the CISO is a critical hire. We have other things that are more critical than, you know, you know, we deal with AWS or Google or another cloud provider and they handle all security for us. I think that those end up making those companies prime targets for, like you said, nation states and things. When you look at supply chain risk, because you do business with those guys, that's where I really think that we're going to be seeing a lot of breaches, and spidering breaches. What do you see from your world? I agree 100%. The supply chain is still very risky. It's very difficult to, to police the supply chain, particularly with, with companies that have a lot of vendors and maybe large vendors. But I'm particularly worried you mentioned healthcare, and, and, and that's still a really largely targeted area, largely because when they don't have the budgets for security, they never focused on it. Like hospitals and healthcare facilities usually use their money to procure technologies for medical use. And then they have all these various networks, the devices themselves, but also, you know, the patients, the doctors, the nurses. And, and so it's really, a, you know, a sieve for a lot of hackers to go after when they're using ransomware, any attacks, not disclosed, they get paid. They have no morals. People trying to help the hospital pro bono. But it's difficult to catch up. So I think, you know, that area, education is another area, and then financial. But you mentioned really the, the crux of it, which is small, medium businesses that just don't understand the implications and, and think, well, I'll go to the cloud, I'm safe. But your data is your data, and you got to protect it, and you're responsible for it. And you have to have the mindset, if you're a company anywhere, cybersecurity is not a revenue issue. It's an operational issue. If you don't have the capability to run your own operations, and make sure that you're not, at least you have you know, resilience or be able to get some response if something happens, you're gonna be out of business quickly or your reputation is gonna be ruined. Small businesses are easy pickings for hackers. They're doing a lot of ransomware attacks and not getting caught. And so it's, it's you know, this is where crime has gone from brick and mortar to digital now. Companies need a wake up call and take responsibility, learn the basics of cyber hygiene to protect themselves against outside expertise, but it, it's not gonna change, it's only gonna get worse. I've been brought in more than one case in the last 15 months where the company has been totally bricked and brought me in after when I started looking at the architecture because I'm a security architect myself, wasn't secure and safe. Backups are backups, but if they brick you out of even getting to the backups or they go ahead and they grab your credentials, that's where I've seen too. Let's grab all the credentials instead and you can't unlock those backups. What them? Like you said, it's not getting those hygienes up front. What do you think that they should do to set themselves up for success? Because I would just tell you, when I talked to CISOs and CTOs, CIOs, it's all over the place. And I think it's extremely dangerous right now. So what do you usually recommend? You start with understanding every industry may be different, but start with a risk management plan. At least they're looking at the right things. There are plenty available. You know, NIST has, MITRE, all of them, but there are a lot of industry specific ones too. And then in that plan, do the basics, you know, which is first, you know, do an inventory of what's in your network, what devices, who, who's got access. Then you're going to likely do penetration testing to see your vulnerabilities. To do that, you have to go through the basic fortifications of cyber hygiene, multi-factor authentication, which helps in a big way. And you can get around it, of course, if you're a really good hacker, but for most of them, they're not going to bother. They're going to go where, where it's the easiest to go. So multi-factor authentication works good. And you can do that with biometrics too. Then of course you have to 
consider firewalls segmenting your data. So it can't be with with different different certificates. So it can't all be taken at once. And then you have to look at you know training your employees. Of course, very important is is look at you know everyone's vulnerable. Anyone can get hacked. I mean the best of them of companies have got hacked. Even the, a lot of the cybersecurity companies have been hacked. So expect to get hacked and have an incident response plan, a resilience plan in place, and you'll be much better off. You can react quicker, understand the implications, and keep your reputation intact. Our time has run out. It's been going real fast. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I have 102,000 followers, and uh, I run a several groups there too, and I have a newsletter. So that's the easiest way to, to follow me or just send me a message there. Much luck. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Rebecca. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Soulful CXO Podcast with Dr. Rebecca Wynn, part of the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then add this show to your favorite podcast player. Subscribe to the ITSP Magazine YouTube channel and share the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to connect your brand to our conversations and our audience, visit itspmagazine.com to learn how to sponsor one or more of our shows. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey.